On today's Locked On Thunder podcast, Maz Draft, Richard Stamen joins us to talk about the Thunder Young Core. Who can be the Thunder's number two option? How good is Cason Wallace? And does Keontae Johnson have the juice? We'll talk about it all coming up. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, and editor-in-chief over at thunderousintentions.com, Ryland Styles. You can follow the show on Twitter at LOThunderPod. Follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. On today's show, we are joined by Richard Stamen at Mavs Draft on Twitter to discuss all of the Thunder Draft stuff and who the second best player on this Thunder team is. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more right now. New customers can bet $5 to get 200 in bonus bets back guaranteed. Visit them right now today at FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Richard, we're finally reunited. How are you doing today, Richard Stamen? Well, so that should tell you everything. I started on mute. Uh, it's been a long off season, Rylan. Uh, it's been very long. A lot of changes for the Thunder. Uh, obviously, our teams had some interactions in the draft night, uh, taking on Davis Bertans to move up two spots. I'm excited for both teams this year, though. So let's start there, Richard. How did you feel on draft night whenever the Thunder traded pick 12 for pick 10 and Davis Bertans? I thought it was good. I really thought if you could, if you were Dallas and you could get off of Davis Bertans without giving up your pick, that's a win. Like, and, and yeah, technically, I guess they gave up their pick, but they, I mean, in a way, they gained an asset, right? It was addition by subtraction. I think ultimately they did the right thing. I think it was a really good trade for both sides. Like, Davis Bertans has ability. He was somebody who actually tries on defense. He was one of the few guys on the Mavs that did, which I think, like last year, that really does say a lot. Now, is he going to ever be good? Probably not, but he tries, and he can still shoot the lights out. Like That ability has not been lost, uh, but Cason Wallace, you know, he's the guy in that trade, not Davis Bertans, and I do think he has really high upside. I'm just curious how that fit works out. So if if you were in charge of the Thunder, how would you use Cason Wallace? How would you use him this year? And then what would you want to see that role evolve into in the future? Well, it's just so hard because of all the guards on the roster. So that's where I'm like – how do you, you have to squeeze him in based on matchups? And I think the benefit for him over guys like, for example, Trey Mann are that he's just such a lights out defender already. And I think arguably a better pick and roll ball handler for others. And I think those are areas where he can win out. But right away, I think he's going to be one of the deep reserves, which is weird because that was the one spot I think where that doesn't, where that happens. Elsewhere, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just, I, I don't know if that would have happened on other teams. So, I just I don't know how it's going to work. I think obviously it's good depth, and I don't think it's a bad pick by any means. I'm just curious how it works right away. So right away, you could see him spend time with the blue with Cam Woods, who's an excellent defensive coach. You could see him uh, mix into the rotation because the way that they're talking about him, Richard. I mean, SGA is a guy who said that Kaysen can play right away. Mark is a guy who said that you know that his teammates you know trust him and, and respect him and so you could see him earn minutes right out of the gate you could see him play for the blue there is no wrong answer really for year 1 with Case and Wallace but when you draft the guy at pick 10 of course that comes with a, with higher expectation picking in the top 10 for Sam Presti especially because Sam Presti hasn't really missed in the top 10 ever so what is the long term view on Case and Wallace if if you we're evaluating him. What is his best outcome in the NBA and how did the Thunder get there? Yeah, I mean, I, I did evaluate him. And, uh, you know, I think for me, I ended up having him, uh, I want to say it was seventh on my board. I'm, I'm double checking that now. But a lot of the Kentucky guards, you know, they, I had him eighth. A lot of the Kentucky guards, there's always a thing about they're always hidden and they explode. SGA is a prime example. Devin Booker is a prime example. And, <laughs> With Case and Wallace, I think the area for him that pops is there's two things. I think his shooting upside is really high because his form still needs work and he's already a good shooter with great touch. I think that's really promising. 
The other thing is that his pick and roll ball handling ability is really strong. And he had zero spacing uh, on rollman, right? Like all of his roles were Oscar Shibway. The most spacing he got was tw- like a 15, 17 foot jump shot. And the NBA, just looking at the roster, right? Like, I mean, let's just go right to it. Like Chet Holmgren is the guy he's going to be popping with. That changes his game drastically. Now we haven't even seen that. We, just, we really haven't seen him play with a pick and pop option almost ever, uh, even dating back to high school. So I think that's an area where you look at a two-way guy who can facilitate offense and create his own shot. That's a really good player. And I, again, I had him at eight, thought it was good value getting him at 10. So I, I think that Casey Wallace is going to be a really good player in this league. I think that he has the work ethic. I think that he has a sc- the, the, the skill set and the tools to do that. Uh, but as you said, this year's the rotation could be interesting to fit him in. I am of the belief that by the end of the year, so I, I'm not going to guarantee this in two weeks, but at some point this year, Casey and Wallace will make a big impact for the Thunder. What do you think a big impact looks like for a rookie Casey and Wallace? I mean, ultimately, it'll end with like all rookie team, right? So I think for him, it's just being a positive defender that plays 20 minutes a game, like approaches 20. He doesn't have to play the full 20. You can't, not everybody can play. Like there's a limited number of minutes, but I think it really starts with the defense. I think with him, the defense is going to be where most of his value, value comes from this year and being able to like be at least league average efficiency on low volume offensively. I think that's a big win for him. That'd be a massive win for him. And so to wrap up the draft class, the Thunder were able to get Keontae Johnson at the end of it at pick 50. That Where was he kind of for you pre-draft expectations? And have you seen anything in summer league or preseason to, to kind of change your opinion? I really liked Keontae. I've been a fan of his since 2018. I ended up having him uh, at 38. There were some off-court issues that worried me, both health and um just legal stuff that I, I don't know enough about, but there were flags, but ultimately everything it seemed to be got cleared. And I think he's going to be somebody that has a real chance to exceed expectations. I mean, even Aaron Wiggins, right. He was somebody that we talked about that could ex- exceed expectations, graduate from that two way. And he has, and I think Keontae Johnson's the next option. Um, to, first of all, it's very confusing. Keontae George and Keontae Johnson in the same draft. That is, I, I have to pause every single time, but with Keontae Johnson, for him, it's he's got this insane first step. He's, he's an excellent athlete, can play defense, can shoot, has great touch, three-level scoring upside. If you were going to take a bet on one of these guys really, really exploding, I think it's him. Like Just across the league, anyone in his kind of situation, I think it's him. I think he's the best gamble. I'm excited to see what Kathy Johnson can bring. Uh, obviously, this is going to get harder and harder as the Thunder continue to rebuild and grow to c- start converting these two-way deals. They have a long track record of doing so to this point, but as you get this roster more set in stone, it'll be harder to do so. But I think he has some juice to him. I think that his athleticism is great for the center team. I think that the shooting at, at Kansas State last year uh, could translate from what we've seen in summer league, what we've seen in training camp. I think that you could see it translate, and if that does translate – uh, then that it's going to be a really, really good pick at pick 50 for the Thunder. So I'm in on Keontae Johnson. I'm in on this draft class in general. I know that uh, Casey Wallace is another guard, but uh, where, where did you fall on the Casey Wallace versus Derek Lively debate in the sense of w- what have you, what were your opinions on that for the Thunder specifically? Yeah, I, I thought Lively was a lottery candidate for one team and one team only. It was the team that took him with Dallas. So um, I think knowing that you had Chet, yeah, you kind of still need the front court help, but you still got to go for talent. Like you can't go for position. I, I just I'm very anti drafting for need in general, with very few exceptions. And I think they made the right decision. He was the best talent left on the board. I think they made the right move. So I, I do too. I, I don't think that they. I don't think that like Chet needs to be pigeonholed just yet. I think that you're gonna you're gonna see the Thunder use this season and beyond to put him at center and let him be a center in the NBA. And the the beautiful thing with the Thunder is people have tried to rush this whole experience, but they have the ability to pivot at any moment in any given time. They have the flexibility with their assets to, if you wind up needing a center next to Chet, though that's the easiest spot to fill is, is a center next to Chet. If you don't end up needing a center next to Chet, then you don't want to handcuff yourself and, and chain him up to a center right now uh, if it doesn't end up being necessary. So 
I, I full heartedly agree with passing on Derek Lively. I hope he has a great career in Dallas. Hope that he does great for the Mavericks. But uh, I, I was a, a full uh, believer in not taking Lively. And of course, if you're not going to take Lively, you're not going to take really any center uh, in that range. So uh, I thought it was a great decision by Sam Presti. I thought it was a great decision by the Thunder. Coming up, though, Richard, you're the draft guy. Any draft classes, their evaluations change year to year. And you get more information and more data points. And the Thunder are at that point now where Josh Giddy's in year three, uh, J Dub and Chet year two ish. Of course, this is going to be year one for Chet. Uh, let's see what what you think about the center team and their young core. Who's going to emerge as the number two piece for the Thunder? All coming up. But first, I want to say right now, but good friends over at FanDuel, FanDuel.com slash locked on, FanDuel.com slash locked on. You can go there right now, and when you place $5, you can get $200 back in bonus bets guaranteed. Win or lose, you place $5, you get $200 back in bonus bets, uh, win or lose. So make sure you check them out today because the NFL season is underway, the college football season is underway, uh, NBA season is already uh, ramping up. So you can bet on preseason games if you want to, but uh, you can bet on spreads, player props, over-unders, award winners. If you go there right now, it's a finner.com slash locked on. And so, Richard, the coach of the year odds have Mark Dagnall being the leader in the clubhouse for the coach of the year award on FanDuel. Would you bet on Mark or the field? No, I'm betting on Mark. They're the breakout team. It's narratives there. The, the actual track record for it is there. I think he's going to be it. So there you have it. That's Richard's uh, opinion on what to do on FanDuel.com slash locked on. And so go there right now. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Richard, we're back on Lockdown Thunder. This is going to be a very fun team to follow. You you teased that they are your breakout team. Part of that breakout team could be finding out who the official number two guy is. You understand that Shea's number one, but when you look at this young core, what jumps out at you? Is there a clear-cut number two, or is that some of the beauty of this core, the fact that there is not a clear-cut number two? What's just your overarching opinion on this young core? Yeah, I think the most fun time for any roster is really just when they're nobody is at the point where i mean okay so you've seen this right in the like early 2010s the late 2000s whatever you want to call that window where they had harden rust ibaka and obviously durant where i think the forming you see the budding stars like one of them's already taken the jump then you got several guys who are clearly on the rise you have the elite role player there's a lot of candidates for that this year and i really enjoy watching those teams and i think those are the kind of like the sweethearts of the NBA, you know, the teams that people want to like, they're hard to hate. They're easy to root for. And they have a lot of upside. They have guys that can take the jump. Jalen Williams. I, I cannot believe I left him out of that. Uh, but you know, he's somebody as well. Josh Giddy. There are all these guys and they have so many different directions they can go. So for me, I really like just the fact that they could go, they can trade Josh Giddy at any given moment and get a really solid return because I don't know this year we're going to find out if they get a number two. I don't think they do that. That's just like a hypothetical and I'm not advocating for it, but with Giddy, for example, like if they wanted to, he's going to have to be up for contract in 2025. That's his contract year. They have to decide, do we want to pay him? Cause eventually now that they're ending their rebuild and transitioning into playoff contention, they're going to get plagued by what every team gets plagued by. In fact, actually what happened to Oklahoma city 11 years ago when they had to decide between Harden and Ibaka, they have to make decisions on, you can't pay everybody. It's not 2K. You can't just stack the teams and guys take pay cuts. You guys want to get paid. And I think that upside is really exciting. But to answer the question, I do think Jalen Williams is probably the best candidate to be the number two, him or Chet. I don't think they can make any harsh, uh, rash decisions, I should say, on who the number two is or going out and getting a, a number two, an unhappy star like Carl Anthony Towns, something like that down the road i don't think they can do that until after the season like you have to write out what you got yeah i think this is this is another year where it's going to sound different to fans because you're used to the last couple of years to hearing like the record doesn't matter because you know it's just house money or you're just looking for draft positioning this year it's the win loser draw it's about just collecting data points of what these young players are and they're hoping to win they're hoping to be that breakout team they're hoping to be uh, that playoff team but just no matter what happens on the court, you're just trying to figure out what these young guys are, what they look like together, and and, and how they grow together. This young core, for, for as much as even the NBA GM survey says that they're the best young core in the NBA, they've not played a single minute together in a regular season game. In fact, 
They still have not played a single minute together to this day because Shea was out on Monday. So, like, they, they have not played at all together uh, in any capacity. So uh, you have to just kind of give them this year to grow. And it could it could look spectacular. It could look just sensational right away. But it also uh, could take some time to, to grow and develop internally. Now, we watch Chet and Wimby play on Monday. Richard, I want you to do this in two parts. Your first part <laughs> is a reminder – of what your evaluation of Chet was entering last year before his injury. So just refresh everyone what the expectations were, what your evaluation was, and and kind of where you stood on Chet before his injury. Yeah, I had Chet as my number two player. Um, I will not say number one just for the sake of uh, not outing myself, but I did have Chet number two, and I only I would have had him number one, I think, if – it was just for me, I was like, can he stay healthy? That was, it wasn't skill-based. I think I still stand by it. I think there's a, well, I don't know. I think Powell is pretty, his upside is pretty high, but I think Chet has an option, an opportunity to catch up to him. He's the only player in the draft that can catch up to him. Uh, with Chet, you look at somebody who the, the defense, it's the same thing as like when Benyama in this way, the defense is so good that it doesn't matter about the size or the, uh, I should say the muscle, the, the strength, all of that, because the shot block timing is incredible. The instincts overall on defense are fantastic. I think he's improved his shot a lot. He had just even dating back to a year ago when he was playing in summer league, right? He played in summer league before the injury, right? Yeah, his, his shot went behind his head. He cocked it back. It was a catapult. Now it's all in front. There's He's changed his release. I think that's big. Uh, you know, just the shooting is there. The the spin move that he has is really strong. He's still difficult to stop with a head of steam, ball handling ability. But really, it's just like that's it. Foul trouble kind of hurt him, and can he defend post-ups without fouling? So I think with him, it's he's just he has the chance to be the best or second best player from that draft still, even after Paolo has solidified himself as a superstar. I'm interested to see what that looks like because I, I think that the Thunder have a shot to have the top three rookies from that from that class. We'll see if that actually comes true with J Dub and Chet um, emerging as as these kind of guys. But you watched him play Wimby. What were your thoughts on his first taste of NBA basketball? I know it's the preseason, but a preseason game had a little bit of a different uh, spice to it because it was him versus Wimby, and the energy felt a bit different. What, what was your just thoughts on Monday night in general? Yeah, first of all, very fun game. Um, I think that was one of the more fun preseason matchups I've seen, but a lot of, I, I think there were two things that really stood out to me. One, the pick and roll threat doesn't matter about the size. He's still going to be very effective there. And also just the finishing at the rim, the rebounding, that combination is going to be really good on putbacks on, on just grabbing the ball because he's so long and so big and he's so good at in, like just instincts, right? Like they're just so strong that I think he's going to grab a lot more rebounds than people anticipate like right away. I think he played really well. Uh, I think Wembenyama outplayed him, but like you know, that's not a knock on him because Wembenyama is probably his top fifty player heading into the year. So he's going to outplay. I mean, that's just quoting like what ESPN put on there, ESPN rake. But <laughs> I saw the reaction. But you know, like it's not a knock on him. I, I think Chet played incredibly well. It's just the stuff that Wembenyama does is it's unmatched. Like there's a reason he's the number one prospect since LeBron. Like it, he's that good. But Chet overall, I think was very good. What do you think the biggest difference is between Chet and Victor, and and what's the what's the gap? Like, if if ten is like a massive gap, like between yeah. between Shea and Theo Pinson, and one is like they're the same player, what what would it be for you? I don't know why, <laughs> man. Theo Pinson, that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> I think the gap overall is like ten to eight. I guess like Wembenyama is like a ten out of ten prospect. Chet's probably like an eight, eight and a half, right? Like, I mean, he was. He was number two pick. It's not that ridiculous. I feel like if, but the differences for me are there's two things. One, I think Wembenyama. It's nothing that Chet can do. It's just Wembenyama is so good at defense. The instincts are like both of them have A grade instincts, but Wembenyama has got like three pluses after it, and that right there is just so incredible. He has more recovery ability from anywhere on the floor, both on offense and defense. The way I mean, he had a play where he he dug the ball out. And then leaked out, got the dunk. It was unbelievable. We've never seen stuff like that. And Chet's doing stuff we've also never seen, but I think just Wembenyama is a little bit better at it. And then on offense, this is the real separator for me is I think Wembenyama has more counters to being stopped with the ball in his hands, especially like as a slasher than Chet does. But that is something where Chet can make up some ground. 
I'm excited to see kind of what this looks like for Chet this year. Obviously, he's going to be tied to Wimby throughout the rest of his career. They're going to be tied together. And so I think that you saw them understand that on Monday, and they they kind of went at each other a little bit uh, within the flow of the game. So that was a lot of fun to follow. I think that this could be uh, a rivalry in the NBA. I think that this could be something where each player wants, and they're, they're so competitive that they want to get the better of the up the opposite player in the the you know the in the uh, lines of the court. So it's going to be a lot of fun coming up, Richard. I want to get your outside perspective on the Thunder season this year. How good can they be? What does breakout team mean for you? For a team that won uh, a 16 win improvement last year, what is what are they going to do to break out this year? We'll talk about it all coming up. We're back on Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Richard, you said the Thunder are the breakout team. So I'm going to ask you, as a basketball junkie, you follow the high school realm, you follow the college realm, and you're an absolute NBA junkie. What's the seed for the Thunder this year? Where are they going to finish at in the Tough West? Oh, man. Uh, there's about 12 teams that are playoff teams. So uh, don't hold me to this off the top of my head. I mean, I think they got it. Like, it's going to come down to health, right? Like Chet's health, Shea's health. Those are the two variables for me. Um, how many games? Shea, Shea, I know he missed some last year, but let me look this up. He missed, Okay, he missed 14. Generally healthy. Uh, I, I'm going to say six seed. I think they, they narrowly missed the play. And, and honestly – like one through 10 is going to be so similar. I don't see one through six having a major drop off. Like it's not a big knock. Six seed would be great for the center team, especially given that, that you're coming at this from like an outside angle of, of, of what you think. So is that, is it safe to say that obviously you take the over on the, on the uh, uh, 44 and a half win total? Or yeah. There, okay. Yeah. And also I, I just like I, their floor is the eight seed. I just, I can't see them finishing worse than eighth. Like they, I, I don't want, I don't even think there's a ceiling on the team. So I'm interested to see if you agree with this rationale. Uh, uh, I've been a proponent of, of kind of the same things that you're saying. One of my one of my reasonings for that is not only how good the Thunder are, but the fact that they're a young team who's going to try in the regular season, and, and that is going to give them a leg up. Like It's going to give you a leg up if you're going to try to win regular season games. So I think that they can kind of take advantage of that also. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good point. And young teams generally, I think, go harder in the regular season like – for example, the Thunder are going to go harder than like an SGA and Chet or Jalen Williams. They're going to go a little bit harder than Kawhi and Paul George, right? Like they're okay with coasting some nights. Then, whereas the Thunder, I think, want it so bad. They're that new kid on the block. It's their first taste of the winning season kind of thing that I think they're going to go harder for it. So, what would be your hottest take about the Thunder <laughs> and your hottest take about the NBA? Both of those things. Man, uh, that's tough. That is that is tough. The hottest take about the NBA <sighs> it doesn't have to be about the Thunder, right? Just anything. Yeah, in the this NBA is just the NBA, just like the NBA as a whole. Yeah, in, anything about the NBA in general. Oh man, uh, I think this is kind of a two for one, but I'm going to try and think of something for the Thunder in a second. Um, okay, I got one for the Thunder. I'll start with that. I think Usman Jang breaks out. I don't know if that's that hot, but I do think he'll solidify himself in the rotation, and they also trade. Uh, Trey Mann and Poku. I think they're going to be the odd men out. But the NBA one, this is kind of ties into the Thunder. I wouldn't be shocked. I know like a Mavs magic draft, so hear me out. Like I hear, I know what I'm about to say. Uh, I got two that relate to all three of those. So the first one is I think the Magic take a, a very similar jump to what the Thunder did, and they don't. They're not going to be that far apart in the wins. Like I, I think it's going to be single digits, five or less different. And I think that the Magic are a playoff team as well, like a top eight team. And then the other one, I think the Mavs are going to – I can't say that a lot. I stopped myself short. I think they're back to the Western Conference Finals this year. That is uh, – that, that is a hot take. I know I'm biased, but I'll say it. <laughs> what, what are you seeing to make you believe that? So with the Magic, I, I think they have the guys taking the jump all together at the right time, and they're very well coached. Uh, and they also, I think they filled in a lot of their holes. I think Joe Ingles helps a lot to help the shooting. That was the big one. And guys are just going to get better naturally, the organic growth at shooting. And with the Mavs, I just, I feel like they updated, they upgraded so much of their roster. And if you have Luka and Kyrie clicking with a, an improved defense, like they were 28th in defense after the trade. So that's not going to happen again. They were 24th overall last year. 
they finished top, uh, I want to say it was top 12, 13, they're like 12th or 13th, or maybe even top 10 the first year under Jason Kidd. You don't magically just lose all of that, right? There was some buy-in issues, I think. I think there were some toxic uh, cultures in the in the locker rooms why they kind of cleaned house. And I think with that, you're going to see more effort from everybody, except maybe one star player. <laughs> I'll see that when I, I believe when I see it. And then ultimately, I just feel like they added so much depth. I think that combination is really going to add up for the Mavs. So with Usman Jang, what do you <laughs> think that the Usman Jang breakout looks like? That's a that's a popular opinion. He's gotten an inch taller. He's had a really good summer. Wow. He's worked with Chip England this summer as well. So maybe the jump shot is there. And in summer league, you saw him get more uh, aggressive, get, play with more force. What do you think that Usman Jang looks like this season as, as kind of a complimentary player? Yeah, I mean, I think his jump shot will be improved. I can't remember what he shot in the G League, but um, I think ultimately he's somebody that it's a reps thing. It's not a form or uh, there's not something that's like consistently broken about his shot. But I think it's just becoming that two-way wing, right? That versatile, I don't even know if he's a wing forward, whatever you even want to call him, just a two-way player, right? Where lockdown defense, like just able to consistently shoot 35 plus percent from three and finish as well at the rim. Like the ideal role player, I think he could certainly evolve into and be that kind of second year breakout in an unconventional way. So I, I'm all in on Usman Jang on the breakout. I like it. I hope that this is a hot take that comes true. Uh, I'm, I'm in on the magic too. I'm in on the magic in the East. Uh, I think they're going to be a really fun team. And that's what stopped me from, uh, from putting Mark as the coach of the year. I know that you did it in our segment, but I feel like last year, him finishing runner up, people are going to view it as like, Hey, he got his flowers last year. And yeah. then Mosley, you know, you get the magic to the playoffs and all of a sudden now maybe it flips to him. So uh, I'm interested to see kind of if Mark can can hold on wire to wire as the favorite because there's always a surprise team in the NBA, it feels like, that, that we're kind of underrating who ends up uh, performing really well. So uh, that'll be a lot, of a lot of fun too. Richard, you're on NBA Big Board. What's coming up? The college season is almost here. The, the overseas season is here. What's coming up for you? Yeah, we, uh, we're doing predictions in the next uh, for the next week. What is it, two weeks till the season? Uh, talking a lot about the rookies, just NBA season, the young players, things like that. And then also the 2024 NBA draft is uh, a wild card is the nice way to put it. And uh, it's definitely a drop off from, from this last year. We were spoiled, but there's a lot of different angles it can go. A lot of teams could be the next kind of thunder, uh, if you will. So I think it's going to be an interesting year. Uh, definitely a fun year to make fun of some people for having bad takes. Probably me again with Walker Kessler, but who knows? It might have a Desmond Bain this year. So, is there a clear cut number one in that 2024 NBA draft? Nope. Nope. I, th I think right. All we know is it's not going to be someone from college. That's about as all much as we know. So it's not going to be KJ Adams. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> is KJ Adams on your big board right now? Uh, he's not top 60. That's going to change this year. Trust me. Hey, I, you know what? Hey, if he can prove me wrong, I'd, I'd love guys proving me wrong. Like I don't want, like I don't bat a thousand. That's okay. Uh, for me, I just, I, I don't know how much I trust the shot. Kind of want to, he's kind of a tweener. I think he's got some, uh, a, a little bit of an uphill battle. I'm all in on the small ball five KJ Adams experience. So uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Richard, uh, always great having you on go check him out at Mavs draft on Twitter, Mavs .com, locked in NBA, big board, all the, th the things that Richard's on go support him. Richard statement at Mavs draft on Twitter. Thanks for joining us. And until tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.